folks welcome inside the parisi palace high above 3773 east broadway this is a live edition of the jake feinberg show mm-hmm. comedy on power talk please go to our website powertalk.live download our free app and stream all of our live local programming including solomon on blast the jim parisi show and yours truly the jake feinberg show and we can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today because it's an honor to bring back a friend of the program, a guy who uh, was patient enough to uh, sit it out and hang with me a few years ago um, as I continue to find my voice. And I've reached a point now where I'm continuing to grow. My tentacles are very far out in the world, just trying to enlighten through rhythm and through leadership and through camaraderie and through big ears. And this cat has done it all and he continues to do it. He's always staying busy. Uh, he's always keeping his ears open, and uh, he's always looking to inspire people on the bandstand. Chuck Rainey, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, Jay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. I just want to get pleasure going. to be back. Well, it's it's always so good to hear your voice, man. And uh, I I want to I want to play you this. Uh, we have a game on this program called uh, Name That Voice. I want you to take a listen to this voice and uh, come back, and we'll break it down. Okay. All right. You know, the the obvious one is, uh, uh, was uh, Josie, was Steely Dan, uh, because, uh, for many reasons, because uh, he was sitting uh, right next to me uh, in this little studio uh, producer's workshop. Um, you know, nowadays everybody's, you know, quite a few feet apart, and, and uh uh, either that or you're or you behind baffles. Well, we were behind baffles in those days too, a lot. But but this particular recording, uh, the room was filled with players, and uh, Chuck was sitting right next to me. He was right by my hi hat, and uh, uh, I don't know where his amp was exactly, but uh, but you know, sitting there next to him all day long was just fantastic. He's just uh, he's one of my favorite people. Always been one of my favorite people. Interesting and funny. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, what a musician. I mean, his, the things I would always want to ask him about, you know, the stuff he and Purdy did, all the, all the history he made, you know. Um, did you get a, did you, when, when you were on the road with uh, Gary Lewis or, or uh, with Delaney and Bonnie, did you ever cross paths when he was playing with King Curtis? No, unfortunately, mm-hmm. uh, I wasn't with Delaney and Bonnie that long. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, but uh, but I did um, I did see them play uh, live at at I think uh, this is terrible for me not to remember this stuff. <clears throat> I think it was a it was a club called the Coconut Grove, mm-hmm. or or uh, or it, it used to be the Coconut Grove, and then they called it something. Else. Anyway, it was a, I think it was a televised thing, and. I cannot remember why I was there, but I remember distinctly watching them and being thrilled at seeing them live. Uh, and and the worst part about what I can't remember is I don't know who the artist was. Well, okay, so listen. But it might have been, I mean, yeah. if it had been Aretha, I would have remembered. Uh, so I, I don't know. Maybe they were the backing, part of a backing band for something. But whatever it was, uh, Chuck and, and uh, Bernard both had tuxedos on, and they looked smashing, and they played like, you know, tuxedos. <laughs> well, going back for a minute. What... All right, Mr. Rainey, who is that? I have no idea. <laughs> this, um, this is why I do this show. Do you want to take a guess? I mean, because um, he did give a couple of clues there. He said Josie. That was the Steely Dan track. And uh, so, I mean, do you want to throw something out there, or even what do you, or do you want me to just tell you? <laughs> well, now, well, now, Asia was a very difficult album to really remember. In that, uh, I did it uh, seven times or six times with different drummers. If I didn't do it with different drummers, there were different drummers that opened up. Like Steve Gadd was an opened up um, that I remember. Um, Although it's you know that goes back thirty some plus years, the, the, I know that. The, yeah, the, that was that was Jim Keltner. Ah, Keltner. Keltner did, and so he went on to talk about uh, this this gig with tuxedos. Does that ring a bell to you that he saw you at <laughs> that you and Bernard well, were in with, tuxes? <laughs> with uh, Aretha and King Curtis, we always wore tuxedos or uh, a, a very uh, uh, 
suit and tie kind of gig. But if it was tuxedos, the Coconut Grove, if I remember, it's in New York. Am I right? I, I, you know that that I'm I'm not sure about. I know Nancy Wilson used to hang there. For some reason, I thought it was like more like Southern California, but I I really could be way off. I I you know to me it was. I did that interview with Keltner. I've done three interviews with Keltner. That was from July of 2015, and and I asked him. Uh, I found this really bizarre album, kind of like a folk album, um, that I, the man who ate the plant, some random cat, and <laughs> and, and and it was on a Tumbleweed Records, and and uh, it was you and Keltner. And so I said, well, when, when what is a, your first time or the most memorable time? And he talked about you sitting next to him. At Jos- during the cutting of Josie, that specific track, I realized that like Asia, you know, there's all sorts of stories about that track and everything else. But that Josie story, he just he was just like, you know, you were right sitting by his hi hat. And um, hmm. in any event, I just kind of wanted you to talk about, you know, looking back on it in a retrospect, and and as we move forward here, without a lot of home studios now, d- do you did you um, do you appreciate the fact that I mean, did you enjoy the fact of coming into the studio or coming into the to the studios before the sun came up and leaving uh, when the sun when you never saw the sun all day? I mean, when you just were doing jingles and, and this might have been in L.A., it might have been in New York. But looking back on it, do you feel how do you feel? Do you feel lucky about that experience? The fact that you were able to cross paths with everybody? I, I'm I'm just I'm what I'm getting at is that. I talk to a lot of my peers now on my show, and there are these musical enclaves that exist in different forms, but there isn't a music industry to support it. And there was at that time, to, in order, there was a touring circuit that when you would make a record, you'd be able to go out and promote that record, and then you'd be back in the studio. So I just kind of wanted you to talk about, as you look back on it, uh, you know, how you feel about that, about the fact that you were, you know, you were on call all the time. Well, of course, I feel good about it. Um, uh, you know, like this, uh, it's very difficult to get into that scene. And uh, I did uh, feel good about it. However, I kind of think being with King Curtis that kind of helped me in that that's where he came out of, uh, you know, back in the like in the 50s. He came out of that. Just about everybody in his band, with the exception of Ray Lucas and uh, uh, some of the other guys, Belton Evans, uh, they did not go to Studio Rock, but just about everybody that came through Curtis's band ended up doing a lot of studio work. That's how I got in the band, because Jimmy Lewis was his bass player, and he was getting more work uh, recording, and Curtis was traveling up the East Coast a whole lot. So now I think that, um, well, number one, that helped. I think uh, I came out of his band, and he always had very, very good uh, musicians. At least, uh, you know, when we were a very good band. So rather than luck, though, I kind of think, um, you know, there's a lot there's a lot to pay attention to, like if you're just not coming out. Number one is you have to really love what you're doing because this is not an easy business, as you may imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but you have to love what you're doing. If you love what you're doing, then you don't, a lot of the negative things kind of go over your head. If they don't go over your head, you sort of make them a never mind because you love playing. So that's one aspect of uh, uh being on call and the more you play of course the better you get the more you learn the system the learn you more what you know the more to do as opposed to well, what not to do as opposed to what to do and of course if you play a whole lot like i said earlier you you, you end up playing a, lo- a lot better and being a much better player because thinking is a large part of uh what a studio musician has to do he has to be aware of all all the records that are already out know all the styles and you know and to play a lot so rather than being i wasn't lucky uh although i can say luck has a lot to do with it mm-hmm. you know i was available i mm-hmm. lived right in manhattan where most of the guys before me lived out on the island and my home was always uh, always in manhattan so it's very easy for me to get to any studio within 10 minutes in new york um <clears throat> Things have changed now. Of course, uh, during those days, you get a chance to meet a lot of musicians that play well. And, of course, uh, I kind of think that ultimately you end up playing as well as uh, the environment that you're around. And I was just lucky enough to have, um, you know, I also think, too, that my name, after a period of time, became more of a habit. 
you know, for about three or four years, when you think of bass in New York and you're doing your recording, you would think of uh, Chuck Green or Ron Carter or uh, Richard Davis or some of the other bass players, you know, um, you would think of them. But because I was always on the scene playing a lot, playing for nothing sometimes, sometimes playing for little, and then sometimes playing for, you know, playing for union scale, uh, I do know I love to play. And I never turned down a gig if I was not if I was not working and you had something to do that, that, that we, you know the way you need the bass player, I'm there. I love to play, so I kind of think that playing a whole lot in all kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of social. Um, I don't know if I'm making sense. No, you, no, the, you, no. Sense. Listen, the point is the music came out of the community and the culture, uh, and 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 with humanity. And I, and I, this is my question for you. And I, I, I can you. I had I did two interviews with Julian Priester uh, lately, the trombonist, and he had an opportunity in Chicago. Uh, he was playing. His dad was a minister, so they, he was playing or singing spirituals, and he also had a chance mm-hmm. to play with um, not just Muddy Waters and some of the bluesmen out there, but he also had a chance to play with Sun Ra. And what he learned from Sun Ra was. He was talking about this idea, and I know, I, I'm trying to take it outside the studio and more to King Curtis. So I want you to try to make this an analogy here. With Sun Ra, the accountability was on the musicians in the band to have their own internal time field, their own rhythm. So they didn't have to rely on the rhythm section to keep time, meaning that it opened up the rhythm section to play the song, to be melodic in a live setting so that everybody had their internal time feel. And I wanted you to talk whether it was King Curtis, whether it was before that. I mean, you've been, you were playing with Youssef Latif and Red Holloway. I mean, th- to me, this was like, did you have an experience on the bandstand before your real studio career started to take off and you became, uh, what would you say, it was a habit? What was, I forget what the, 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 the term you used for Chuck Rainey, but it was like- Yeah, my name, my name associated with the bass became- when was the first uh, opportunity yeah, with like with Curtis or with one of the these gigs that you were on uh, uh, where you were able to where everybody had their own internal time feel and you were truly able to play the song and not just be a timekeeper? Well, that's a very interesting question where you phrase that. In working with King Curtis, the internal time was always dance music. Uh, although we played all kinds of music, we had we had all kinds of venues, jazz, pop. We even had a, well, we never had really a bar mitzvah or a Latin gig, but it was all popular music or jazz. And uh, our internal time basically was all about him. Uh, that's it's hard to word describe what I mean, other than that he set the tempos, he set the feel, and of course having a good drummer that has a good time does help. Yes. Now the the difference I noticed with Sun Ra was like I I didn't really care that much for uh, the music presentation and that you know, um, and that I didn't you know it was sort of kind of <clears throat> how can I say it was Sun Ra-ish. you know <laughs> sometimes it's hard yeah no, I dig man I to, dig I dig to, yeah it's kind of hard to feel uh, what you know what the core changes are and uh, also too the kind of music was that ec- eclectic jazz. I call it, you know, uh, the kind of stuff where uh, a guy like, and then again, too, a lot of those musicians, uh, I I did a uh, a, a, a gig with uh, Jack DeJanet one time, actually, uh, at uh, in Elkhart, Indiana, at the Cleese Jazz Festival. And from the moment that the leader, I don't know whose song it was, counted it off, counted it off, I was lost. I couldn't feel where one was. Wow. But I had been tutored many years earlier by Bobby Durham, who said, Chuck, you're worrying too much about it. You can't count this. You've got to just feel it. And so working with Bobby, I sort of kind of began to just let it go and just feel where it is. Um, uh, the, uh, so with King Curtis, to answer your question specifically, we all had an internal feel for time but it was basically a combination of everybody. See, with King Curtis, me and Ray Lucas and Cornell Dupree, we played so much together that we had the same time, uh, time feeling on all songs because we played so much. And then, of course, we had a great leader. 
Um, you know, so like the, the time basically, uh, the how we play basically is a result of how King Curtis led the band. He was a great leader. Also, too, he chose very good musicians. Now, we weren't all perfect, and we all learned from each other. Um, but basically, it's like, that question is kind of hard to answer in that, you know, a lot of times you listen to records where you can tell that one person in the band has the time feel, and everybody's following that one person, which I guess in our case it was the same thing. If I had a good bass pattern going on, then uh, they were sort of kind of adjust to... Uh, but time, you know, it's, it's very difficult, uh, uh, Jake. And we all were alike in a way. We all have the same thing. We were the younger crew in New York at that time. Um, we had the same time, but then that time was all fixated and led by a great leader. Do I answer that question? Well, no. Oh, you're doing. Funny. You're first of all. You're doing a fantastic job. I. You never played with. You don't remember the leader of this Elkhart Jazz Fest. You don't remember who was leading the, the band. Well, you just know there was DJ. Yeah. Um, I forget who the piano player was, but it was. Uh, I believe it was Sonny Rollins. I think was in that band. Uh, we have a year on this. Uh, it was like early '60s or something. When, when is this? No, it wasn't '60s. This was um, had to be in the '80s. Here's my. I want to. I want to go back. This is so important because you didn't play with the abstraction cats like Sun Ra or Ornette. I don't think you played with Ornette. But no. no. Um, can you talk about Bobby Durham? I don't. I have not realized. I don't. I, I because this is the most important thing. It's a, it's the concept that any note can be the one. James Jamerson used to get frustrated with cats when he moved out to L.A., as you might, may or may not know. People would be like, where's the one? Where's the one? And he's like, any note can be the one. But you were talking about Bobby telling you that it was, you got to feel it. I mean, can you talk about a, a, an experience you had with him, how he taught you to really feel and not be so consumed about where the one is, but more often feel it, especially if you weren't playing with Cornell and Ray Lucas and the cats that you had already developed an internal, uh, tick, you know, time feel with. Well, Bobby was, I think, one of the greatest drummers ever lived, at least that I worked with. Right. Um, but he was an excellent drummer, and also, too, he was a social friend. Now, when you're social friends with someone and you hang out a lot together, uh, there are a lot of things you get understood without words, if you follow what I'm saying. Uh, every now and then, but I used to complain about... Uh, in working with Bobby when we were playing really fast tempos, uh, like with King Curtis, which reminds me, remind me to talk about um, uh, um, uh, King Curtis again. Sure. Uh, but now with Bobby, Bobby was an excellent jazz drummer, uh, like Harvey Mason. Right. Very good jazz drummers. And a lot of that, like uh, Jack, G, Jack D. Jeanette, a very good jazz drummer. Well, he's good. All these people are drummers, all around drummers to begin with, very, very good. Right. However, in jazz, especially up tempo jazz or very slow ballads, there's a thing where um, you, you got to pay attention to what everybody else is doing because it can be very, very hard to play very slow tempos if you're not paying attention to everybody, mm. especially to the drummer. Mm. The same way for the drummer, he's got to be paying attention, but the, 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 the drummer is very, very important. So Bobby used to always say that I'm thinking too much <clears throat> because I had been playing R&B and pop. But when it came to walking the bass and being real, real free, I had the tendency not to do as much of that, although with Curtis we did do some of it. I know Mingus pulled me to a side one time, and then we, we, we had played a tune called Sweet and Lovely, and he said that uh, the, the bass notes should be uh, around and long, you know, because everybody hears that. He said, if you play them real long, it supports the sound uh, of the ballad. Mingus said that? Also, too, yeah. Oh, man, that's awesome. You know, and I was playing the notes too short, which a lot of electric players do do when they're playing uh, uh, a popular ballads or when they're playing jazz. Rather than they're, they're more or less like a do, 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 as opposed to a do, 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 like the upright bass does. Uh, but it all comes from experience, though. And after working with Bobby, I had a chance to really understand what he says. And then don't worry about it, because if it's fast enough, ain't nobody going to know but us that you ain't. I mean, you all one is. Don't get me wrong. 
you know what it, you know where one is. It's just that you don't know where the chord is over that one, especially when it goes from verse to verse or from verse to chords, verse to bridge, whatever the case may be. You know, finding out where the song is because if the song is so fast, sometimes you just don't know. You listen to a lot of it today, and um, uh, a lot of uh, avant-garde jazz, up simple stuff, and it's kind of hard to figure out what the changes are. And because the bass sometimes does not hit always on the one, or the other, you always hit on the one. It's the chord changes. Right. You know, maybe I'm playing one, but he he got me into feeling that number one, just play the song, because if you're a musician, you can hear at least where a pulse is. So I know where his hi hat is. So I know there's no problem with one, but then I don't know where I am in the song. You know, for a while. So after working with him, I think I worked with Bobby in the band for about a year maybe a little longer, uh, worked in the band with him before I got to King Curtis. Now, King Curtis uh, I did a song called Sister Sadie, and uh, it's still around. I think I have it somewhere in my little catalog of it, but uh, <laughs> it was Sister Sadie. It's very, very fast, very fast. Right, um, right. And um, I'm talking about very fast. <laughs> and so, like, I remember in rehearsing it, Jimmy Lewis, the bass player before me in the band, he... Uh, I remember going and seeing them as, as often as I could just to hear the place, just to say it because it's wrong. Ray Lucas was an excellent swing drummer. Uh, he was a good drummer all around in any respect, but like when they played this song. So when I got in the band, I always had a problem with the stage because I it was hard playing, the, uh, playing on, playing knowing where one is as associated with the chord, like going to a bridge. And of course you have to have physical dexterity to be able to play real, 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 real fast. And this song was very, very fast. Um, unusually fast. Um, so where I just had trouble keeping up for a minute until I realized, like what Bobby had told me, he said, you play enough to where you have the physical dexterity to do this. You just have to not worry about it. So about where one is. I'd had some problems from time to time in working with Harvey and then I was trying to count, especially in jazz, because he's swinging and he's an excellent drummer. And so I have to be reminded, thanks to Bobby Dunn, uh, just to get immerse myself into the feel of the sound to where I'm not dragging or pushing or I'm playing like if the chord's going from G to C, I hit C with everybody else. Because I do believe that if you listen to a song, if you listen to the bass player, you you know what the changes are. Because the bass player usually plays the downbeat of every chord, or the downbeat of every section of a song, or you know, like when chords change. Uh, so that was a good learning experience with Bobby Durham and uh, and Ray Lewis. Did you? Um, did, let me. I just want to be clear about something. You played with Bobby in what context before King Curtis? The, the, what I'm trying to get at is like, I mean, also. Uh, you're always playing the the Fender bass or the electric bass during this time? I mean, there was never any upright for Chuck Rainey ever? Uh, no, definitely not, did, not during that time at all. So, so um, this is just so... So go back. You said you wanted to touch on King Curtis. King Curtis to me is amazing because he was playing dance music. Like, he was playing mm -hmm. danceable with R&B, but there, I mean, he knew jazz and he could play jazz standards, but he wasn't playing Sun Raj kind of kind of music no but, but no uh, King Curtis was uh, was a, a master of what he's doing he's got an album called Azure and uh, it could be I found it in Stuttgart uh, but he uh, the jazz that we played was like anybody else but it was not outside of harmony and theory although when I say that I gotta be careful because people play the way they want to play right however with King Curtis he was an excellent musician uh, and that he wasn't Sunraj at all. I'm not putting Sunraj down no at way. all. But like he played, uh, uh, you know, like he was an excellent jazz player. And when I say remind me of King Curtis, I was talking about that tune, Sister Sadie. And that when we recorded the song, I was lost. About 15 seconds of the song, I was lost. I didn't know where I was. <laughs> but I just kept playing. And when you listen to the record, it's hard. You know, you can't tell. You can tell that I was lost. I mean... Has I, I I was talking to a uh, Ricky Murata uh, a, a little mm -hmm. while a while back, and he he was talking. I mean, I don't care if it was Spider Web, Pretty Purdy, uh, you know, uh, Bobby Durham, uh, Frank's, you know, whoever it was. 
uh, they everybody had their own individual sound. I mean, it didn't Pete LaRocca, Tony Williams didn't matter. Everybody had their own sound. But when the drum machine came in, and then real human beings started to emulate a machine, it really affected the ability to feel. I I, I wanted you to. I know you go to a lot of tuba conventions. You take your 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 nieces, your your family, your grandkids. I mean, the t you you've been very articulate on my show about the tuba, and how it influenced mm -hmm. your time. You know, just just the 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 bottom end but do you think that um the machines have machines make things very easy and they can replicate pretty well but isn't it hard do they get in the way of humanity now especially as it relates to human time feel the ability because every listen i mean a drummer's time feel is not coming from his shoulders and his arms it's coming from his heart and everyone's got their own time feel so i just machine i'm just trying to get this idea of um, especially for peeps that are listening, that are searching, I mean, that don't have the same culture, that mu they don't have the same opportunities that you might have had touring on the bandstand. What is the media, what is the balance between humanity and machines in your mind in 2017 and how to, how to, how to work with that to get a very, so you, you're comfortable feeling, feeling the music and not feeling a machine. Well, I kind of think it's great, uh, actually, because like it hasn't it hasn't slowed down anything, it hasn't stopped anything. Now, of course, you got a lot of icon drummers that have a certain little nuance that they do that see what to play with. Uh, however, um, I don't think that the machine is. Uh, you just have more people now that um, they use a machine. I don't mind working with a machine at all because I'm working with the overall sound of everything. Although it's always great to have a conversation and a smile or just to have a relationship with a person as opposed to a machine. Um, but the machine does work. The machine does work very well because outside of all the icon drummers that are well known for having specialties in, in their field, um, uh, there are also a lot of drummers that are pain in the butt. <laughs> just well, like I'm sure there are, a lot of, there are a lot of bass players that are pain in the butt and they, they play... Uh, they're good musicians, but they can't play. Right. What does that mean? No, what, does that mean? That, what does that mean? What does that mean? I mean, well, they're good musicians, but they can't play. It's kind of hard. I, I I got that phrase from English, from Charles Mingus. Well, it doesn't um, mean doesn't mean they can't play with with human beings. Like they might have great facility, but they, no. Go ahead. No, no. It just means that I work with a lot of people that are they you know they they know music, they know what they're doing, but you don't. But they don't kind of fit. They can't play. I mean, it's very, very hard. You know, the old folks, you're going to have to ask somebody over than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's kind of difficult to really explain what that term means. But, you know, there are a lot of people that have all the theory. Uh -huh. They have all their everything going. They have chops. But they can't play with, you know, they don't play well in the music and supporting the musicians that are around them. Right. And that is usually only felt by the musicians that they're playing with or other musicians that are listening. You know, and there are a lot of drummers that are just C drummers. I mean, they're good drummers now. You know, they, they play well, but they don't have that Bernard Purdy or James Katzen kind of kind of Harvey Mason kind of thing that would identify who they are and they really supports the music a whole lot. And, they, you know, they don't come dime a dozen. They do not come a dime a dozen. You find that a lot of musicians, basically the drummers that are on a lot of recordings, and you see their name a lot, they usually fit well with each other. And uh, going back, you know, they understand the music. They, they, they play it. And then a lot of times things, um, um, it's very difficult. You probably should ask this question to everybody that you've been talking to. I, I will. I'm just, you know, I, some cats also, got I into some cats thing. It's that simple. Um, talking to Chuck Rainey here on the Jake Feinberg Show live on Power Talk. Um, did, uh, so I'm going to, I want you to listen to this. This is, a, this is not a, a guessing game. I want you to just listen to this cat. I, I, a guy I interviewed a couple of days ago. You might have actually, you might very well know him and have been to his store, but um, I just want you to be aware that your name and, and your legacy continues to reign supreme on the Jake Feinberg Show. So take a listen to this, and then we'll, uh, we'll break it down. Um, <clears throat> what, what happened as music started getting louder, um, 
you know, you needed something that wasn't going to feed back and that you wouldn't need, uh, you know, certain amplification with. So Leo Fender uh, introduced the precision bass in uh, around 1951. And uh, what he did was he took like a solid plank of wood, made a comfortable fretted neck, and um, it was just the way that you could actually compete with a, a drum set where drummers were playing louder and, uh, you know, just where the whole... Uh, band was getting louder without having to deal with acoustic amplification. The acoustic instruments a lot of times feed back. So um, what you want is you want something that you're going to get kind of an even response and that you can just turn up the amp and, and be present in the recordings. So, um, you know, they first introduced the precision bass. Um, also, back early, too, Gibson had a bass called an EB-1 violin bass. Wow, wow. And that sort of had a, you know, they're very interesting sounding, but they're a little more muddy. The, the precision bass really gave the bass player a chance to really have good note articulation. You could kind of hear the notes real well. With the Gibson bass, you heard like this low kind of thud, and you could kind of feel the note, but it wasn't real distinct. So the Fender bass, I mean, was so popular back in the day that if you look at a lot of the... Uh, original recordings and stuff like that, like Chuck Rainey and people like that, you know, um, when you, when you listen to that kind of stuff, a lot of times on the album, it would say playing Fender bass. Yes. It was, you yeah. know, it was yeah. almost synonymous <laughs> with just electric. All right, Mr. Rainey, I know I'm stretching you out today. That, that, that's, a, that's a cat named Norm Harris, Norm's vintage guitars. I'm not sure if you've ever been to that store. It's in California. Oh, uh, no, I haven't. So uh, I want you to talk about this. First of all, the idea of saying, were you in situations playing the electric bass with acoustic instruments? Did you run into that uh, feedback uh, amplification problem? And uh, also, like, I, I, it was very invigorating when I interviewed Bucky Pizzarelli, who I probably should ask about that where's the one question. Uh, you know, he was one of the first cats with jingles to be using the Fender bass guitar. And I wanted you to talk about the first time that you, or one of the earliest memories you used, when you used the Fender bass guitar, and then what did you move on to after the Fender bass guitar, the precision bass, uh, Fender bass guitar? Well, I never called the instrument a guitar. Um, <clears throat> it's very confusing. I've had uh, some situations uh, with a lot of older orchestrators who thought it was a guitar, mm. a bass guitar. <clears throat> where they had to be reminded of school that a bass guitar is an actual guitar, except that it's strung an octave lower. Uh, 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 this and uh, I'll forget Al, uh, there's someone, uh, Vinny, Vinny, uh, Vinny, Vinny ba Bell. Vinny Bell, yeah, yeah, yeah. In New York. Eric Gale, they all played uh, the Fender bass, but they were readers, more or less, and except in some cases where you just, uh, you know, promote your idea. But all the all the orchestra would do would just write the part in the treble clef, right? And then they would just play it like they're playing guitar. But however, when it comes to me, it's a bass, and that it is although it is an octave lower, it is bigger. Also, too, um, it's um, it, it's uh, although I do play a lot of guitar on my bass because I was a guitar player before I played the bass. Hmm. But I never really moved on to any other instrument until it got to a point to where. Other manufacturers began to court me, and Fender, and Fender never did. Once I started doing a lot of recordings, you know, a lot of different manufacturers would begin to court me, and Fender never did. They never gave me the time of day. I never asked um, for the time of day from them just to respond to certain kind of things. But all in all, since we're talking about Fender, Fender has been very rude, very rude, R-U-D-E, to a lot of us older guys. They end up playing the instrument that made the instrument possible. Hmm. Uh, very, very rude. Um, they're only interested in young people, and they just take they, they, they just don't understand that their instrument during that time was the only instrument. If you didn't have a Fender, uh, having a Fender, uh, it's 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 uh, uh, as a certain ratio of my work that I did was because I was playing a Fender bass. Um, it was very easy to record. The pickup system is it's a passive bass. It has a certain sound. It sounds just like the upright, although depending upon your touch, 
but it does sound just like the upright. Or it can, you know, you can do, you can't bow it, but you can play long, round tones, beautiful tones. It's very easy, easy to record with it. Basically, when I listen to a record and I really like what's going on, I can tell if it's a Fender or if it's not. Hmm. Because a Fender has a certain kind of uh, mid-range thing to it that it's hard to um, hard to compete with, and a lot of manufacturers have tried tried it. So I began to play other basses uh, once I was um, uh, offered. Uh, which one? Which people? Um, which companies courted you? All of them, except Gibson. And Fender didn't. Fender didn't court you, did they? No, Fender just their corporate structure is a little bit different. And that uh, I remember they had a tour they put together in Philip Church was uh, uh, doing a Fender base uh, a base um, seminar clinics for for uh, for Fender. And I remember offering because Philip Church is a good musician, he's a good guitar player, but he's not a bass player. Um, <clears throat> whereas if you're a guitar player, you think guitar the role of the guitar. If you're a bass player, you play bass. You think of the bass, and a lot of guitar players can play bass. But they're not bass players. Wow, that makes sense. this is mind blowing. Okay, I, I'm yeah, I'm trying to process all. So like Eric Gale was not a bass player either, right? I mean, he played Fender bass, but he was not a bass player. Yeah, he, that's how I got in the business. Eric had been playing bass. Um, I mean, overdubbing yep. the guitar or the bass when he was contracting, and he, he loved Jameson. But then again, he was not a bass player, guitar player, but he could play in the bass. The bass, as you know, is just like the guitar, the first four strings. That's right. The top four strings. So Eric was a good bass player for the music that he chose to play, or that he did play on the pop recordings and during that era in New York. Um, so when it comes to the sound, especially if you play with a pick, because the notes will be clean. Um, and then, of course, the music was not, in fact, in that day, music was not as energetic as it is now. Uh, so you would think that a bass player would be a better bass player uh, than a guitar player, although there are some people that I guess can play them both very, very well. But again, either you're a bass player or you're a guitar player. You know, there are a lot of people that play a lot of instruments. Like Tom Scott played a little, little uh, he, he, he played a little bit of bass, but he ain't a bass player. <laughs> but he plays a bass. He plays the bass. Well, he can play the bass. I'll put it that way, you know, because a bass... Everybody can play the bass. Can you right. go back to the? I didn't mean to cut you off. The Upchurch seminar. He was doing a f seminar on, on the Fender bass. Yeah. And what what was the? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what 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 was? Did you find that it was not he that he was, it was coming across that he was trying to portray himself as a bass player, but he was actually really a guitar player. No, no, he was just a good musician that could play the bass. And the Fender had him out on a little tour, doing bass seminars. And of course, he played it with a pick. Um, but I offered my service. You never heard back from him. Um, Philip Church was not really, also, he was not really known that well as a musician at the time, at that particular time, other than in jazz, because he's a jazz guitar player, like uh, Eric Hill was. Eric Hill was a jazz guitar player. Um, <clears throat> very he'd, difficult sometimes. Yeah, he did play. Right? He did play the Fender bass. Upchurch played the Fender bass guitar on a lot of the staple singers' early stuff out of chat. Yeah. Okay, but I go like with this leads perfectly because I wanted you like with Donny Hathaway with those great sessions. What kind of bass were you playing? Because uh, that always, always, I only had one bass. That was my Fender. Fender, Fender. Okay, so just for the layperson, I, I, I'm. It's that, that you had a Fender bass guitar. Right, right. A, a Fender bass, uh, a P, a P bass, a precision bass. A precision bass. Do you remember what you moved on to, especially like uh, as at, with the Crusaders uh, when they were trying to bass Fender bass. Fender bass again. Fender bass. And you've you. When did you actually? What was the next evolution? Like when the music, I don't know, uh, when you started to get into the mid '70s, with the music got even louder, and you know, quote unquote, fusion came in, and whether it was uh, Gene Harris or, you know, when, when when the music got louder, what what was your electric bass of choice? Well, I always I played Defender up until um, I would say the mid '80s. 
and then I needed to hear what, 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 what the year and a half was, especially when slapping started. <clears throat> I see my 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 influences to play the bass have been all been upright players, <clears throat> and I end up playing. Um, I mean, uh, that's the sound that I always heard was the upright bass, even before I got to New York. Um, Doc on and Jay, what did you ask me? No, you know what? It, I want you to talk about. So, my, I, well, what I was asking you is when you when you got to the slapping, you changed your the, the bass. All right. Yeah. That's when I began to slap because when you slap the friend the bass. Two things happen. Number one, in order to really get the slap sound, you got to put a lot of treble on the bass. Mm -hmm. Now, once you start putting treble on the bass, to me, the bass disappears in a way. Um, why do you say, why do you bass. say that? Why do you say that? It's not it's not the sound of the bass because I've been listening to upright players, and I've been listening to and listening to Fender bass players. Now, if you're going to slap it, you have to put more treble. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. You had to put more treble on the bass in order to hear the slap and the rhythm from it. The Fender doesn't do that, <laughs> or my Fender didn't do it. No Fender did it at that time. Nowadays, uh, the Fender does have active basses. When you put an active switch, and now you uh, the uh, the bass does not really sound. Um, well, actually, even as I'm talking about this, some kind of way it's, it has developed to where. I haven't really investigated the Fender that much because I've just been into other instruments since the mid '80s. Sure. Uh, um, uh, but I began to want to slap the bass because I always slapped it, like the upright players slap it. Then again, I don't have as much wood as they have on the electric bass. Um, so I started trying other instruments that had a different, um, different, different ability to get a, a different sound out of the bass, while at the same time keeping a good bass thing going. Like Lewis Johnson was one of my favorite uh, people, and it also to a very good bass player. Wow. However, I didn't care that much for his sound hmm. because he was a great slapper, and the bass is a little thin to me. That's just my personal opinion. It takes nothing away from his uh, his talent or his ability, but I always wanted to stay as close to a real bass. The bass sound maybe put an edge on it, and like a uptown funk. I don't know who's playing that bass, but see, that bass has good bass. Also, too, when he slaps it, you can hear that pop, but it's incorporated evenly into the sound of the bass. Now, of course, he's not the only one. There are a lot of people, but going back to the to, to the era that we're talking about, everybody played a Fender. Like right now, all just about every church choir that I see that's on TV or on social media, the bass player is playing a six-string Ken Smith. For some reason, that's just the sound that everybody is going for. And the, can, you know, the bass sounds real, real good. Kenny's basses are very, very good. Um, but all the church bass players play that six-string Ken Smith. And the bass sounds good. You know, so I guess it's just a matter of um, how also touch has a lot to do with uh, the sound of the bass. You know, but the Fender was the easiest to record all my sound and last longer than 15 seconds. All I did was cut it on. Nowadays, you gotta work a little bit harder to get the sound that everybody's gonna be satisfied with. And with most basses, you can't get them. You know, Mike has got a good bass, Stuart Spector's got a good bass. They all have their identifiable sounds. I can usually tell if it's a Tobias bass or a, um, I like, or a, um, well, an MTD bass or a uh, Spectre bass. I can tell. I know those sounds. They're different. Not saying anything negative, uh, so or saying anything negative about them, but they just have a particular sound. And I was just born and raised on the sound of a, of a Fender bass. Where every time I get a bass, like right now I'm playing exotic basses that are made in Japan. Wow. And uh, what been, makes them, what makes them them. exotic? What makes them exotic in your mind, or why are they exotic? Well, it's just a name. Oh, it's a, just the name. Okay, it's just a, it's just the brand. Yeah. Uh, th this yeah. this is, this is uh, I want to go back. This is really important. You mentioned Mingus. Your all your influences were upright players. Um, can you talk about a few of the cats like uh, Wilbur Ware or even Monk Montgomery cats? That I mean, Monk was the first. I'll, I usually talk about this trivia question, but apparently, in on record in jazz. In 1953, he was the first cat to be recorded with the Fender bass guitar. It was an Art Farmer record from 1953. But who were your 
who were the cats that you would go to who were playing upright and you were just in awe of those cats? Who were your – Oh, were, I can't. Oh, I, I came up around Mel Hinton and Georgia Vivier and uh, Richard Davis. Wow, wow. Um, wow. Those were – and also, too, there's an upright player at home where I come from. Who was, that's the only bass that I heard, or rhythm-wise, you know. Um, but I came up in New York around Joseph Vivier, Mel Hinton, and Richard Davis. And um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Ron Carter? No, not Ron Carter. Um uh, this bass player was a left-handed bass player, and he played an hand-paid baby bass. Hmm. Uh, I can't think of his name offhand, but those were the guys that I was constantly around. Also, too, I was around uh, and talking to a lot of people. Um, too, uh, Sam Stewart was also very, very intriguing to me, and he had a certain sound, uh, and he also sang with his bass notes. I remember that very, very well. Um, Richard Davis gave me my first bass lesson, and then Bob Cranshaw was the second person that I became socially involved with, and is very, very good friend. Bless his heart. Yeah, rest um, in peace. That's right. Uh, a very good bass player. Played both instruments. He was a very kind man. And through Bob, I think I began to. I was already playing the electric bass, but then of course, uh, although the uh, uh, the acoustic bass players were the people that I was mainly have been listening to, you know, you start. Uh, Especially if you're in New York, you start hearing some very talented electric players that you begin to really, um, and you know, all, it, all all of them were playing a Fender up until um, maybe the mid '80s. Even Ray Brown had a red Fender sitting on the Merv Griffin show that he never touched. <laughs> the, the, the the I just I, what I was trying to with Slam or Hinton or De Vivier, can you talk about how, how, I mean, I know you made that point about Mingus and I thought it was beautiful, but how did those cats make the notes round? How did, I mean, how did they do that on the upright bass and how did you, what did you learn from them about how to make the notes round? You have to hold, <laughs> you got to hold that neck and just play the notes longer. See, that wood bass, the upright bass is a much bigger instrument. You got to put your arms around it and it's a vertical instrument. So as you're playing up and uh, up and down the bass, you find that most bass players are very, very strong, and uh, from the elbow down to, the, to to their fingertips, because you have to really um, compress. And then, of course, too, the octaves on the upright bass are about an inch and a half wider or longer from each other than they are on the electric bass, because the neck is so long and so big. So it's just it's just you have to have muscle. Uh, control in your arms, your forearms, and in your hands, and you just have to work it. Now, if you don't play the upright bass, you don't have to have those kind of muscles. Uh, with the electric bass, you do have to have certain kind of muscles for the influence that you're doing because even though it's the electric, you still have to produce a tone, and you can't play it lazily. Uh, so it's just a matter of the player understanding that notes need to be rounder or longer in ballads or popular music. Uh, uh, that's not that hard to do with an electric bass at all. When it comes to walking, where the notes are going by so fast, you have this a certain way you have to begin to go and make each note uh, agree with the very next note, not agree with it, but just so that it's even. You know, the two instruments are entirely different, but they serve the same person, you know, the same purpose. They do, but I'm... I play, yeah, go ahead. I have um, several electric uprights in the house, but I never really play them, only here. I don't take them out. I probably have done maybe one or two sessions, probably no more than three on on on, on, uh, on upright bass. Where I just rented the bass, it wasn't my personal bass, and it was a ballad or a very slow pop song. Or a doom, 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 you know, one of those kind of things. Right. Other than actually playing it or reading from it, you know, I've never done that. I mean, I do it at home, but professionally, I don't do it. What, the first lesson you got from Richard Davis was he giving you a lesson on the upright bass and you were playing the electric. I mean, what you said there, they said, started... no, go ahead. No, it was two. Uh, we were, there, were, there were two elect two uprights. And he was just showing me positions and stuff like that and what it takes to do this and what it takes to do that. And of course, my problem would be in playing octave because from C to C or from any note octave, 
you know, the spread is different with the hand, which means you gotta, uh, you have to have another muscle, not another muscle, but you have to have a different kind of use of that muscle because that stretch is a lot bigger. <clears throat> a whole lot bigger. Now, of course, if you're already playing one instrument successfully, in order to get into playing another one, then, then, then you have to now um, get another muscle memory going on. You got to get another habit going on with the stretch and stuff like that. You have a tendency, I have a tendency not to bother with only past a certain point. Nobody's hiring me to play it, and I don't play it near as well as I do the electric bass, so I don't put that much time into it. I just do it for um, this personal pleasure when I do do it. That's phenomenal. I mean, I, this is so important. Um, Chuck, but, you know, uh, do you, can you talk a little bit about uh, the kind of gigs that you're, I mean, what is the musical enclave like where you're at now? I mean, not get, not people that are calling you up and saying, hey, I want to fly you out and do this bass camp or play on this studio session, but just like locally in in your town, do you play gigs out? And what is that? musical enclave look like uh, where you live? Well, basically here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area here in the heart of Texas it's mainly a, a country western rhythm and blues and, uh, and jazz town. And whenever people are doing sessions I think all the sessions the sessions I do here is all R&B or pop uh, or a fusion of country and, and R&B, something like that. So here locally, it's just a top 40 town, an oldie but goodie town, mm. I would say. Now, of course, in every town, you have people that are doing new music. And every now and then, I get a chance to basically do that every now and then. But basically, the major things that I do around here when in doing it is basically R&B or uh, uh, easy pop. I haven't done that much jazz since I've been here. How do you... Uh... I, I, I'm just asking you, uh, being that it's it's you know this uh, oldie but goodie town. How do you keep the stuff from being formulaic? How do you, uh, for for cats out there that are that are searching for their own individual voice, how do you how do you keep the music fresh? Tunes that you've been playing for for decades. I mean, how do you keep it fresh? Well, to me, it's always, it's, it's just for, number one, I love music, mm -hmm. and I love playing the bass, so when I play an oldie but goodie song, or a regular, uh, a regular rhythm and blues kind of thing, I enjoy it. Um, it's, it that doesn't have to be new. Uh, there are times where you do add a fusion element to stuff like that, but uh, and that doesn't happen that much. You know, you find a lot of that happening in the cities, uh, like New York, uh, down in Florida, uh, Miami, or uh, in uh, L.A., and there are other places. Now, they do have an element here in Dallas that uh, that plays original music. And sometimes it's, uh, and it is what it is. It has a following, you know. Um, but I don't, I'm not engaged that much in that kind of music. <clears throat> Being a bit old-fashioned and um, coming from a traditional point of view, um, Everything that I do that if I have control over is basically, well, it all depends on what the, what the project is, you know, but uh, I do have, a, I'm very creative about certain kinds of music. I'm like, I, I sent you my CD. Yeah. But, you know, that that is basically everybody has their thing about where they think the music is. So rather than do something R&B-ish, you know, I want to be on the same road, but with a new pavement, if that makes sense. <laughs> Oh, I, I mean, there's nothing better than new pavement. You're not going to hit any potholes, you know? <laughs> then you got the old roads, though, with no potholes that are very smooth. They just dirt roads going to the same place, you know? Yeah, no, that's... Sort of, I was, yeah, I mean, I, I I, just... Before we wrap here, Chuck, it's been a mind blower again. Um, did you... Uh, what, could you talk a little bit about... Um, you know, going back to the days of Aretha, and uh, days of what? Uh, yeah, the, the 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 days of when you were touring with Aretha Franklin, and mm -hmm. um and, and King Curtis. Can you talk about uh, the significance that Bill Graham had on 
on the music, pushing the music forward? Uh, and ultimately, uh, d did you play both? I know you played the Fillmore East, but did you get out to the Fillmore West? And did you ever wind up playing with any of the original cats like that came from Chicago, like Howlin' Wolf or those cats that came out at, uh, to the Fillmore West? Uh, no, I didn't. Basically, being an East Coast guy, uh, I've been to the Fillmore West, but only to visit or see another act. I've never played there. Interesting. As a matter of fact, I have. I played the Fillmore West with somebody. <sighs> Who? And I think it was I think it was Sonny Stitt, Kenny Burrell. Oh my God. Sonny Burke and myself. That is going. That's yeah. going back before Bill Graham, right? I mean, that's 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 during the uh, Charles Sullivan days when it was all. That was all black economy out there. Uh, this this had to be when I first moved to L.A. So that was in the early 70s. Interesting. Very early 70s. Bill Graham? And I was spending what, time. What was your... Oh, what, no, not... Yeah. Well, I don't know if Bill Graham was involved with it then. Um, hmm. Well, just in general, what, what, what do you think his significance was to... I mean, I've talked to some, David Clayton Thomas, you know, was... Uh, was reminiscing about uh, blood. My man, my man, my man. He was. My man. I got. I got to send you that interview because he was talking about you a lot. But um, he, you know, he was. He got on a, a, with a. Um, I can't remember the name now. I'm gonna have to look it up. But you know, basically, blood, sweat, and tears was was not known to anybody, and they got on a bill uh, with uh, uh, with another major act, and that was their break. So it seems to me that Graham gave a lot of opportunities uh to to cats and i just you know to me it was like i just want i always like purdy talked about him and i wanted to ask you uh about what you think his significance is uh, to uh to american music and culture well he provided a venue for a lot of people during an era to hear different bands now i never met him um but I, I, of course i know who he is um I would think that he's very, very important, like a lot of producers are, or promoters are, a great promoter, uh, that they just have a knack for getting venues and putting bands that have talent. See, Blood, Sweat, and Tears were a good horn band, except that their attraction was David Clayton Thomas. Right. Beautiful voice, great voice for that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so a lot of people just have, a lot of promoters have talent in choosing something that, or looking for something that's going to be pleasurable for the audience that they're promoting music for. So I do think that Bill Graham would be one of the uh, uh, Hall of Fame promoters of that era because a lot of bands that I was in, you know, he was responsible for booking the venue. Um, of course, being a side man, you never really see or enjoy what the leader does or what the artist does. But for me, it's never necessary because I'm just, you know, I'm just, glad that out of all the bass players in New York, I'm on this gig. I happen to have this particular spot as opposed to 10 or 15 other guys that can have it just as well. So I've always kept my place out of it. I've been a good side man. And, uh, you know, you hear things, you keep them in your mind, you know, who promoted it and stuff like that. But you never really get a chance to socialize with them or be with them because you're, 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 you're a musician, you're a band. A uh, band member, not an artist. Or, 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 or the band leader. You know, so a lot of people listening and looking at social media today, they think they need to know about everything and know everything about what they're doing, where to me it's never, it was never necessary. They need a bass player and they chose me, they got a bass player. That's all I'm interested in is playing the bass. <laughs> now, of course, once you, hear, no, once you hear other things, of course you do hear things about what's going on, but you keep it there, but I'm basically... The bass player. You know, I've had trouble with bands that I put together here in Texas, and then everybody wants to know what I know. They want to know what does the year cost and who's it for. And, and like, even if it's uh, and they all, everybody's now got their own CD. You know, between me and you, some pain in the butt, and that I came up differently. You know, like if you're going you're going to do a gig, everybody in the band wants the sound check because that's what they see on social media. However, there's always somebody checking the drums and checking the bass and checking the guitar, uh, the sound of it. Also, and then they want to sell their CD. So if you're working for, if you say you say you're working with the artist is uh, Joe Blow. Everybody, <clears throat> Joe Blow got the gig. 
Uh, it's all Joe, Joe Blow has uh, all the contacts. Now everybody in the band wants to know what Joe knows, how much he's working. You know, um, have a lot to say about what songs they do. I've run into that a lot too. I'll have band members to say that, that uh, you know this is too fast, but it's my band. It ain't your band. That's right. I've never questioned any band leader about the songs that they chose to do or, or what tempo they want to play it in. You know, so nowadays, you know, like you have to just go back to guys who want to, who, you know, the, there are a lot of guys here that play very, very well, but they're paying the butt. They ask too many questions. <laughs> they bring too many people to rehearsals. Um, you want to make sure that they, their CD can be sold. But it ain't your gig, bro. <laughs> it's not your gig. Right, and then you know, it's also about, like, you know, stop with the micromanaging and the handlers and just hit it. I mean, just have a, have, I mean, there's, there's an element of fun and imperfection that seems to be missing from my generation as a Gen Xer and younger generations where it's just like, I mean, you can dial everything into the zero point zero zero one and get it absolutely super tight and perfect. And yet I don't think that that's really the key to, playing having fun on the bandstand you know i mean to me it's a drag after a while especially if you're bringing people in that have no idea or have no part in that particular context you know i agree when i got look at it now you know people that teach you separate kenny or kenny rogers they go so far as that they make it clear to the band the management the band members don't even look at them which i think is ridiculous you know but to where they're so big and so probably they don't want the band members to be social with them. Yeah, I don't and, think. And then the band members are told, don't look at it. Not to look at somebody that can kiss my butt. And I don't really mean kiss my butt. You know what I mean. I'm being very, very kind because we're on the air. That's right. Um, but however, they do that for a reason. You know, because nowadays, you call some people for a session, they want to know, they want to know what company it is, who's the artist, how do I know them, uh, how much you're being paid. Now, some of that, you can tell them how much you're being paid when it is. You know, you got people coming to the studio, and at the session, they want a copy of what you just recorded. you got to tell them, man, this is ridiculous. What do you mean you want a copy? I've never asked not one promoter, not one producer or artist for a copy of a track that I did. All you're going to do is play it for, all they're going to do is play it for their friends and give them something to talk about. Because of social media. Social media has really messed up a lot of people. And then you want to get there too quick. You want to be popular because your wife and your friends and your siblings or whatever. Everybody says you're good. Doesn't mean that you're good. That's right. The people, you know, but they want to please the wife or please the girlfriend or be important. You run across a lot of side musicians that are just a, just a pain in the butt. You well, go too far, by the way. And I'll just say that, I mean, I think part of it, it doesn't matter if it's Dallas or New York or wherever it is, but the fact that you were seeing each other all the time made made the trust factor. I mean, they might have you might have known that you were playing with a pain in the butt, but you knew they weren't going to be asking 12 or, I mean, you even said it last time, you worked with cats that were drug addicts and alcoholics and you tried to help them the best you could, but you knew that they could play, you knew they'd play their role, and then you went home. And now because of, of because we're actually more, even though we're all interconnected digitally, musicians especially don't see each other as much. So all this insecurity spills out when actually a date is being put together. Well, how much are gonna get paid? I want a copy of that, you know. It's not like, okay, we'll be back tomorrow. You know, th that's also part of the issue is, I mean, it's like you tell somebody to run down the block for 10 bucks, they're gonna do it. Because, you know, for you, it was there was a gig on Monday and there was three on Tuesday and maybe you'd play with Roberto Flack on the weekends or I don't mean, you know, it didn't it was just there was just so much there that you were more secure. And these are just, you know, these are just things that are part of our time and it's cyclical. And and, uh, you know, I mean, part of my job is this is not preservation. This is about promotion. This is about how younger generations like my daughters will know or try to understand how real music is made going back to Ray Lucas and going back to cats like Bobby Durham and ultimately you and, and spider web and all and spider rice and all these cats. I mean, that's how real music is made and, and it's not made by showing off or, you know, getting, talking, getting the talking mo too much. talking to talking, <clears throat> just stop talking really. So, 
I mean, we've, we've been cooking here for 65 minutes, Mr. Rainey, and uh, I had a ball, man. It's so great to talk. I, I was transcri- I transcribe all our interviews, and I'll send you all the excerpts if you ever put a book together or, you know, you want to use them in any way. Um, but uh, this was my favorite, and um, I really had a ball with you, man. Thank you, brother. Well, man, you're very, very welcome. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, man. It really is. One day I'm going to get a chance to meet personally. Yeah, no, I'm going to drive out to Dallas when you, when you, when, when, uh, if you got a good gig or something unique that you're putting together and you feel good, please let me know and I'll be, I'd love to come out and promote it and, uh, and, and have a ball. Well, my friend, you're, you're, you're especially welcome and I will do that for sure. Much love, Chuck. We'll talk to you soon, man. Okay. All right, man. Thank you very much. Take care. Much love. Peace. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> A master, Chuck Rainey, on the base. That's our third interview, and we're going to be back in a few minutes with another legendary cat in his own mind, or maybe not even in his own mind, bassist Paul Stallworth, coming up on the Jake Feinberg Show right after this. 